This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 11th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular weekly segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the Walker Drygas campaign offers some troubling insight into their PFD and through it, their fiscal policy proposals. Second, after defying the odds to develop an agreed set of proposals, legislative leadership now seems intent on avoiding the recommendations of the Comprehensive Fiscal Policy Working Group. And third, why we are relieved the Alaska Retirement Management Board rejected the administration's efforts to tinker with the main PERS and TERS investment accounts. And now, let's join Michael. All right, Brad. So we've got the weekly top three, and we're going to dive uh, into that and uh, be ready to go. The first thing is the Walker administration and the whack-a-mole um, and uh, the whack-a-mole picture, which I just had to laugh because the governor, Dunleavy, has been using this term whack-a-mole for a while, and it seems like they're trying to co-opt it in their discussion of what's going on. Tell us what you see here. Well, uh, this was a post by Heidi Dragas, who's the Walker's uh, lieutenant governor uh, uh, match uh, in the campaign. Um, and it was a post on Twitter that was that was taking another shot uh, at, uh, 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 at Governor Dunleavy, as, as they're doing during the campaign. Largely, they've been taking shots at Dunleavy. Walker and, and Dragas have been taking shots at Dunleavy around – uh, the governor's handling of COVID um, and other similar things. It sort of borrows from the 2014 playbook that Walker used with uh, Governor Par then Governor Parnell uh, around uh, the National Guard uh, scandal. Uh, at the time, if you'll recall that, uh, Walker uh, kept hitting Parnell about his handling of uh, some allegations relating to uh, the National Guard, the Alaska National Guard. Uh, to try to uh, undermine uh, uh, Parnell's uh, character, and 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 largely Walker's been doing the same thing with respect to Dunleavy, focusing on uh, focusing on uh, uh, COVID and 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 his and, and the governor's handling of other things. I've been waiting to see some indication about uh, what the Walker Dragas. Uh, a position on fiscal policy was going to be, um, given that given that, <laughs> given that Walker lost after uh, after the PFD cuts, I was I've been curious about how they're going to handle that. And Walker, I haven't seen anything that Walker has said yet uh, directly on that subject. But this week, Dragas uh, said something that uh, that that finally uh, hit on the hit on the point. And and the tweet says this: Anyone else feel like we're playing whack-a-mole with Governor Dunleavy's bad ideas? Dunleavy Mahoney's uh, uh, revenue commissioner, Lucinda Mahoney, Mahoney's latest risk, latest would risk the state pension system solely for a massive PFD payout. His hail mary uh, play for re-election. We're going to talk about uh, the uh, the pension proposal uh, in the third segment, but what really caught my attention uh, here was Dragas picking up the the theme that some have used uh, that uh, Gov Governor Dunleavy is pushing for a massive, massive PFD payout. Well, as we know from from 
the news and, and the show and other things, what Governor Dunleavy is now proposing is a 50-50 uh, POMV, uh, PFD, a, a, a PFD based upon 50% of the POMV draw right. every year. Right. And at least for at least for FY22, uh, that's a 40% cut from the statutory PFD. So if if the Walker Dragas position is that Governor Dunleavy's current position, which is POMV 5050, is massive, what does that tell us about what Walker Walker Dragas thinks the the proper uh, PFD uh, position should be? Um, some, something less than something more uh, than the 40% uh, PFD cut uh, stat, cut in statutory PFD that that Governor Dunleavy has has already proposed. I, it's going to be interesting to me to see how this, see how they play out, how they handle the, uh, how they handle the PFD. But this is, I think, this is a very bad start for them uh, by by claiming that that the governor, Governor Dunleavy's current position, uh, still at 50-50 POMV is is still a massive quote massive their word not mine, a massive PFD payout uh, because I think it just sets them up for, you know, for for people to focus back in on and say, oh yeah, Governor Walker was the one that cut the PFD. We all remember that now. And now he wants to cut it even more right. uh, uh, from from where Governor Dunleavy is proposed. Well, again, the irony of saying that it is a massive PFD when he has set aside the full statutory PFD, he set aside and is not even talking about what the other thing he ran on, which was a full payback of previous PFDs that were taken under Walker um, yeah. So, I mean, again, I, I think it's, it's, it's on point. You're salient and on point here. I mean, how much, if this is a massive PFD, what was your plan, Bill? What did you want to put out there to the Alaska people? Oh, a hundred dollar PFD, a $200 PFD. That's the one we can afford quote unquote. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, quite honestly, I don't know anybody that has supported, and I've been speaking to people over the last couple of weeks. I don't know anyone who would support Bill Walker for governor. I'm not sure that this, that you know, I mean, with the whole jungle primary and the and the and the rank choice voting, maybe that's where he thinks he gets the chance to to do it. But I don't see anybody jumping to Bill Walker as the savior of Alaska's uh, permanent fund and the state economy. Well. As, as Kevin McCabe has pointed out, quite rightly, Bryce Edgman, uh, ID, uh, Ivy Spahn holds, Andy Josephson. I mean, you can you can go through the Joey Merrick. Uh, you can go through the co-chairs that 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 Walker has listed out there uh, of uh, of his of his campaign co-chairs. Kathy Geisel, which you know I said on the program last week or the week before, tells me all I want to know about Bill Walker, this campaign of Bill Walker's. Um, it's I mean he's got he he's he's got uh, 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 substantial support among the quote political establishment, um, uh, at least on the at least on the Democrat side, and uh, and with uh, with Merrick uh, and uh, and Geisel on the Republican side, um, and it's you know it's going to be it's going to be interesting. He's going to get money. He's got money. He has individual money, and he's going to get and he's going to get donations. Uh, uh, frankly, from probably the top twenty percent. Who view who view this this uh, this this position of that the POMV 5050 is now a massive PFD? Um, who view that as 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 a good thing? Um, basically, I, I mean, you, you could read too much into this into this tweet, but but by calling it a massive PFD payout, it's clear that he has in mind a much smaller. I mean, massive would imply that he has in mind. A much smaller PFD that he's going to fund government uh, on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families by uh, uh, through uh, through additional PFD cuts, and you know that's going to be a top twenty percent uh, uh, position. Um, right. I don't think I don't think Gun Dunleavy is going to get the top twenty percent. I doubt if Les Guerra gets the top twenty percent. Um, and so you know you, you Walker's going to have money behind him, and he's going to have the establishment behind him. So it's not you, you can't. I, I understand among among our group, the people you talk to, the people I talk to, that there's not going to be a huge wave for uh, for Walker. But uh, but you know you look at those co-chairs and it's a it's a it's a long list of uh, of uh, of who's who in the uh, uh, in the in the top twenty percent in the political establishment world. The uh, interesting thing here is is that uh, he also brings Walker also brings a lot of baggage and he brings with him baggage of an anti-oil industry sentiment 
um, you know, and and the fact that again he was trying to uh, you know p- uh, partner up with China to do the whole inline in-state gas line thing. I mean, things that you know never really came to fruition that were more in the long term became pipe dreams more than anything else. Does that factor into it in your thought? Oh, I mean, it factors into you know, he's going to get support out of those people who would benefit from construction contracts from constructing the pipeline or. You know, we're going to hear a lot about, you know, reinflating the state's construction budget, uh, capital budget. Uh, he's going to get support uh, uh, from from that. I, he's he, he likely will not get a lot of support from the oil industry. Less certainly won't get support from the oil industry. So at, looking at the players right now, looking at the candidates right now, that likely would flow to uh, uh, flow to Dunleavy. But uh, uh you know, Walker's it, th- there's going to be support for him. I think, Michael, what we're likely to see is is it, as as we've seen thus far is a replay of the 2014 game plan against Parnell uh, with uh, attacks on uh, character attacks uh, in the case of Parnell against the national on the National Guard handling of the National Guard and against Dunleavy on the handling of COVID. And and I'm sure they will bring up other things as we go along. Uh, the the firings the the court decisions right uh, right uh, but you know it's but you've got the, the the real issues of the state are around fiscal policy right if we don't get fiscal policy right it, everything else is going to fall apart um, and so you've got we're going to have to look for insights into what that what his fiscal policy is in Heidi's uh, Heidi's post calling uh, Dunleavy's uh, proposed PFD a massive PFD payout I think is probably the best insight I've seen thus far uh, with respect to where that fiscal policy is going to be. It's going to be continue state government, continue state spending, fund it through PFD cuts, fund it on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families, save the top 20 percent um, and uh, and and keep on going down that road. The governor's campaign has already started. started. I think Kevin McCabe has uh, in, in Tim Bradner's story in The Frontiersman and elsewhere, I've seen uh, Kevin's theory that uh, that the governor's campaign is already in the legislature. When you look at who is the cha- who are the chair of, of key committees and who's on Walker's uh, uh, Walker's uh, 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 co- uh, list of co-chairs, uh, the Walker campaign list of co-chairs, I right. think I think that's a great insight that the uh, that the governor's campaign has already started and already leaked into the the legislative process. So when people talk about oh we're gonna we're going to deal with the uh, uh, deal with the you know fiscal policy next uh, session uh, uh, when Stedman talks about that or when Tasha talks about that or when Click talks about that. We're going to come with a bill. We're going to de- it all all they all uh, that's really going to happen next session uh, is uh, is posturing uh, to try to you know set up Walker or possibly some will try to set up less. Uh, in uh, uh, in the legislature, and you know we, we we've we've lost we've lost this biennial. We've lost the uh, the 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 21 2021 and the 2022 uh, biennial to to try to solve the fiscal problem. We've just lost it because it's now become swallowed up uh, in the in the political campaigns. And it, as we'll talk about when we come back from the break, I think that's showing through clearly in what's going on with uh, fiscal policy. Proposals not only um, uh, not only uh, in in this session, but the fiscal policy proposals that people are talking about coming out uh, in the in the next regular session as well. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're about to uh, give us a tease here. We got about a minute here uh, before we go to break on the number two, which is the fiscal policy working group plan, which was laid out that no one is even looking at at this point. Yeah, it's uh, there are, are a couple of stories this week. One in Alaska public media uh, that Andrew Kitchenman did. Another that uh, Tim Bradner did uh, for the Frontiers, Frontiersman, and is also in the Anchorage Press. Uh, both good summaries of uh, of where uh, of where things stand uh, down in the legislature. And and it's you know we we went through this whole um, uh, episode with. Uh, Putting together the working group, uh, agreeing on on having a working group, putting together the working group, you know, talking about the strength of the working group is that it's you know two people from every caucus, so you've got a broad spectrum. The the surprising uh, success of the working group in coming together, not only on an agreed set of numbers, 
but also on an agreed set of principles going forward, fairly specific principles going forward. Uh, and then the praise that followed that uh, of the working group actually achieving that, everybody from Kevin McCabe on one side, Kevin McCabe and Ben Carpenter on one side, to uh, uh, to uh, 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 various uh, various members of the House uh, majority and, and Senate minority on the other side. Um, and uh, and and all of that uh, success put together, and and now you know that gets presented to the legislature, and now it just seems like a, like nobody wants to pay attention to that. They want to right. go off in their own direction. So we're going to talk about that before we went to break. We were talking about uh, number two, which is this fiscal policy working group plan, and how they had this plan. They came out with it. I mean, it wasn't fleshed out. It was more of a framework. But what was astonishing was that you had all these all these separate people. I mean, all these people of completely different political backgrounds, you know, JKT and all these folks. But the eight of them came together and they came out and with with decisions. They all agreed on something, and then that immediately went absolutely nowhere. And uh, Brad, you have some thoughts on this uh, as we continue. Well, one of the one of the big things I think that came out of the working group was an agreement on 50 50 uh, pfd 50 50 pomv uh pfd i think that was a huge huge step forward in in trying to resolve this because again i mean keep in mind that 50 50 pomv um is a, a 40 percent cut uh in the pfd in the current statutory pfd so that's a big step uh, from from those who have, who have been advocates of the statutory PFD to come come down to that, um, and it was a step for the other side, uh, who have who have to some degree advocated um, uh, smaller PFDs to to come up and agree to that. So I think that I think that to me was the biggest uh, core uh, step of uh, of uh, of the working group. Now they didn't agree on how, on how to get there. I mean, there were there were two different approaches. One approach was to stair step up by by implementing additional re or substitute revenues uh, to replace using PFD cuts to support the budget. Uh, another was to use the bridge that the governors talked about. The governors advocated. They didn't reach agreement on on that particular step of how to get to 50/50 POMV. But the agreement on 50/50 POMV itself, I thought, was a, was was a huge step. So. We get to the special session. Um, they did that before the last special session. Uh, there was some activity on uh, the Senate side around that, but it sort of died uh, as it sort of made its way through uh, Senate finance and then finally limped to the floor. Uh, there wasn't all that much activity on the House side. Uh, the governor calls another special session um, and and first bill out of the, out of the chute the bill, the bill that's going to be uh, up for hearing today uh, before House Ways and Means uh, is a 25, 75 uh, POMV uh, PFD. There's not, <laughs> not even a bill on the House, to my knowledge, there's not even a bill uh, on the House side that would implement uh, what the working group, uh, what the working group proposed. And, and one of the big, you know, maybe it's not a shock, a little bit of a shock to me, though. One of the members of uh, the working group was uh, uh, Anchorage uh, House Independent, uh, Calvin Schrage, um, who was a member of the working group, participated in the discussions, uh, signed off on the uh, working group uh, proposal. Um, Schrage's on Ways and Means, and to my knowledge, he hasn't proposed uh, uh, what the working group proposed, which was a which is a 50-50 POMV. I mean, basically, basically, the the working group did, I think, a, a surprisingly good job coming together from the left and from the right with a set of principles that, that, that could form the foundation of going forward and leadership on both sides, Senate finance on the Senate side and now Ways and Means on the House side, chaired by Ivy Sponholtz, one of the co-chairs co of Governor Dunley or Governor Walker's campaign, um, have just trashed it and just, you know, discarded it and are, and are going uh, going their own uh, separate ways. Maybe the lesson of this is the final step of the working group should have been to, to put together hard legislation, legislative language 
that then can be introduced by members as as a bill to be taken forward. They didn't have they didn't really have the time to do that, but there isn't a bill. I mean, the the the, the issue here is there isn't a bill in in either body right now that that fully incorporates what the working group uh, did. So leadership's just going off in their own direction. Um, there, whether you were, whether you stair stepped. Or the, the, back to the working group, whether you stair stepped or whether you did the bridge that uh, the the bridge loan or the bridge financing out of out of the ERA as Governor Dunleavy advocates. Either way, the working group recognized a need for additional revenues, um, and House leadership is really you know said basically we don't like taxes. We're not going to have addition. We're not going to have uh, substitute revenues. So even that side is seems to be undermining what the working group did. Big promise uh, out of the working group, big step, I think, out of the working group, uh, but it's fallen as a thud uh, in both uh, in both legislative bodies and doesn't seem to be headed anywhere at all. The uh, I didn't I unfortunately, I couldn't read the um, article in the Frontiersman from Tim Bradner. Well, I know he brought uh, Kevin McCabe into the mix because paywall. Uh, but uh, to give me, give us a rundown there with the things that Kevin McCabe said uh, on that that you agree with or disagree with. Well, if you uh, uh, I think I think the version in the Anchorage Press, Brad Bradner writes also for the Anchorage Press, and I think the ber- version in the Anchorage Press in front of the paywall. Um, but basically, it's a very it's a very thorough job as Tim Bradner does, running through what the various the various legislative reactions. It leads with Kevin quotes from Kevin. But it's also got quotes in there from Andy Josephson, who you know is a 25-75 advocate. Andy Josephson, who's also a co-chair of the Walker campaign, um, and uh, and goes through sort of a very, as Tim does, goes through a very uh, thorough analysis of where uh, the legislation sits. Uh, and and Andy really takes on the role of being the leading advocate for 75-25. Andy also sits on. Uh, ways and means, and so is a is a proponent of the bill that's uh, that's uh, being considered there. Um, one thing it doesn't do is get quotes from JKT or from Calvin Schrage or from others who Donnie Olson, who sat on the working group um, as uh, as as other members of the working group and and sort of probe them why they aren't pushing uh, the working group uh, 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 proposals. Um, and um, and and I, JKT uh, uh, has an interesting position in the in the House Majority, um, and I would have since he was a co-chair or a co-facilitator, as they called it, of the working group. I would have hoped he would have been a proponent of uh, of, of pushing it harder, uh, but he seems to be you know have 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 fallen into the background on this and let uh, let others. Uh, who weren't on the working group take the lead on what the on what the majority is doing. But very very thorough article. If you can't get if you don't subscribe to the Frontiersman, um, uh, I think you can find it on the on the. I did. Yeah, I found it out for the press. I find it interesting that you point out to say that, you know, that the House uh, that the House majority seems to have no interest in talking about uh, new revenues or new taxes. And yet that's the one thing that Andy Josephson is quoted in this article talking about. He says that Dunleavy refusing to commit to proposals for new revenues basically is making it not work. But at the same time, they're the ones that aren't really pushing for any of that. So, again, the fact that they don't have a combined floor session uh, with the members of the working group sitting in front of them and answering all the questions as to how they came to the conclusions that they did, to me, is very telling. Yeah, and and the fact that Calvin Schrage, I mean, I, I, I want to particularly focus on him because he lobbied to get on the working group. He lobbied to, to, to become a member and to get a high profile of getting on the of getting on the working group and you know beca- working on the solution, Calvin Schrage, uh signed on to the working group solution of uh, of of achieving POMV fifty fifty in some in some sense signed on the solution of uh, of of revenues in some sense and yet he sits on work, ways and means and 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 is not and 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 is silent uh, on the issue of uh, of what the working group proposed. Mike Prox, uh, not not to not to just be one sided on this. Mike Prox, a, a, a standby alternate member uh, of the working group, um, uh, also sets on ways and means. And to my knowledge, Prox hasn't been a, an advocate of uh, 
uh, of of the working group solution in ways and means. So, you know, it's 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 sort of a plague on all your houses. Everybody's running. The working group did hard work and came to a hard, difficult solution that that involved compromises. Shockingly, surprisingly, given the members uh, and the differences of the members on the working group, uh, and did hard work and came to came to what I think is a very good product. Um, and, and it's just it's it's hugely disappointing that that this you know people on both sides just seem to be running away from it running back into their uh, into their prior positions sort of leaving leaving this advance that the working group achieved leaving this advance just sort of isolated out there with uh, with uh, with nowhere to go and this goes back again to kind of that whole thing of the uh, 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 kind of the whole thing of the uh, political uh, race getting into it kevin mccabe is quoted as saying uh, you know, he said, uh, I don't think any support for the fiscal policy working group product will ever get out of the rules committee in the House. Who, why would the rule chairs, who is a co-chair of the Walker campaign, want to give Governor Dunleavy a win? I mean, this is, again, all tall man bad, and this is where the politics of the governor's race is already starting to play in. Yeah, I, you know, it's not it, the, the, the House. The House majority deserves a lot of blame. Uh, but as we've talked about on the show before, the governor isn't blameless. I mean, he's not he's not put revenues on the table. He's, right. He, he's he's you know not filled in that chunk of, of of where this goes. So it's just sort of everybody pointing at everybody else. My point is the working group I thought made did good work came to a, came to a very a very good advance on getting this issue resolved. Uh, and then and now everybody's just running away from it in, in, in opposite direction. Warren asks, has any one of them said a word about stop spending so much? Well, there was some discussion of that in the fiscal policy working group. In fact, in their conclusions, there were cuts that were laid out in that plan. I mean, the plan called for cuts. It called for an increase on the oil taxes. It called for a new revenue stream. It called for that. I mean, there was it, it was a pretty comprehensive layout there. I mean, there was not a whole lot of stuff left on the floor when it was all said and done. Uh, and it included two or three hundred million dollars worth of cuts by the time it was all said and done. So it had a little bit of everything, but nobody wanted to take it up. And I think that is probably the biggest shame uh, that we've seen so far in this uh, in this last uh, session here, Brad. Yeah, it it would be it would be helpful if 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 either individual members or collectively as a group, if the working group put a bill together that that incorporated uh, uh, their proposals um, and put that and 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 submitted that bill so it could be the focus of hearings. Of course, the the leadership on both sides might ignore it, but it could be the focus of hearings and and people could could focus on the details of of what they put together. Uh, I think that would advance uh, advance the ball uh, if they did that. But you know, it's it's not it, it, it it's part of it's part of the issue it's part of the issue where the uh, uh, where leadership on both sides just don't want to deal with it. So you know, you've got the committees. Uh, House Ways and Means that have, that are that's doing their own bill that's starting out with a 2575 uh, PFD and and so there isn't there isn't a bill that can that everybody can focus on and say this is the product of the working group let's 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 start there we 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 set these guys up to go reach an agreement shockingly they did let's start there and uh, and build on the product uh, of their work. Not, it's not happened on either side. Right. So there have been talks about cuts and, of course, proposed, but now they won't even look at that as well, along with the rest of the comprehensive plan. It's pretty crazy. Greg just said, I grow weary of our government in action. And in some cases, I think that the powers that be, the um, the you know the, the business as usual crowd, the Von Imhoffs, the Stedmans, and, and uh, the Stutzes and people like that, I think that they – that they do that intentionally, that they they want to create this stuff. They they figure that if they can wear people down, people just will not participate anymore. And um, and I I, I I used to think it was just kind of a fringe thing that happened, uh, you know. But, but I think now it may be intentional. What do you say? Well, certainly, uh, certainly with uh, with how they're handling the the working group. I mean, they're trying to trying to run out the clock, right? I mean, they're trying to ignore it. Run out the clock. Uh, the 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 energy, the 
the the support, the the uh, uh, sense of accomplishment that the working group achieved, uh, all that's being dissipated by you know by them just you know wandering off in other directions and 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 not focusing on the results uh, of the working group. So yeah, I I, I mean they're they, they're off in their own little world and and they don't like people messing with their with their world. Uh, and if they can just drag it out, uh, you know, people lose interest and go off on other things. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets, AK4SB.com. They are on YouTube. I was chastised here a minute ago because they're, <laughs> they are on YouTube. They're on Facebook. You can find them everywhere and uh, and do all that stuff. Uh, so I appreciate it. Uh, Brad, your thoughts on the Senate. Um, we heard the uh, Senate president come on last week and he talked about a few things, um, uh, including, you know, whether or not the Senate was actually going to get anything done. Do you think that under the current leadership, the Senate is going to be able to actually do anything or is it going to take a full change in what's going on? Michael, I think that's going to uh, take another election. Uh, the Alaska Senate, uh, I've been paying attention to, you know, how people line up a new Senate if uh, if there was a, a restructuring. Um, it looks like it's a, a 10-10 or an 11-9, depending upon where David Wilson goes at any given point in time. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like the U.S. Senate. It's, it's sort of come to a grinding halt. Um, and uh, and it's not going to go forward. If you if you have a restructuring, you know that Click and and uh, and Bert and Natasha and as you pointed out, uh, uh, Revac uh, are going to go and, and Gary Stevens are going to go over uh, to the other side. They're going to go to the the non-conservative side, non-fiscal conservative side. Um, uh, uh, Begich uh, saw that the Senator Begich said that he's not going to be a part of of, of joining with the conservatives. So I, I just think, I think it's just stalled out and I don't see any progress the remainder of this session or the next regular session. Disappointing, I guess is what I have to say about that. Brad Keithley, our guest, the weekly top three continues. We're on to number three. Uh, Brad, this all comes down to the dreaded words that I never wanted to hear, which is I agree with Dermot Cole. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, look, D Dermot's a, he's a nice guy, I'm sure in many ways, but uh, he also, uh, he and I probably disagree on almost everything under the sun, but uh, with, I'm with you on this. I'm starting to agree that this, <clears throat> this position that the Dunleavy administration is taking is problematic to say the least. And Dermot Cole explains why. Um, how in the world can you live with yourself, Brad, that you agree with Dermot Cole on this? Give us your take on what's going on. <laughs> well, Michael, in, in, in my defense, maybe, uh, I will say that this issue originally got raised by the Alaska Municipal League. Right. Um, it, it wasn't initially raised by Dermot. And AML is the one that, that uh, has, has pursued it. Dermot <laughs> sort of picked it up. Uh, it's an issue that's come on quickly, and Dermot sort of picked it up. Uh, and started covering it in his blog, uh, and and became sort of the source of information uh, on the issue uh, as it went along. It hasn't hit, to my knowledge, it never hit the the Anchorage Daily News. It never hit the Fairbanks News Miner, uh, Juno Empire, or even the, uh, the 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 Alaska Business Journal. It's uh, sort of sort of run uh, under the undercover. Um, and after AML raised it, Dermot uh, was the one that, that picked it up. It involves uh, PERS and TERS, which is a fairly arcane area uh, of both accounting uh, and the law. Uh, but what? But but and it involves a Dunleavy administration proposal on changing how PERS and TERS calculates their annual amortization. Uh, PERS and TERS uh, consists of uh, of of is, is it, the, the the defined benefit portion, the tier one portion uh, that the state's on the hook for, uh, is funded in large part through uh, a pot of money, an investment amount uh, that's been built up over time, uh, and that is used to spin off earnings, to sort to sort of like the permanent fund is used to spin off spin off earnings that pay for the state's uh, defined benefit, uh, PERS and TERS. Uh, obligations. The state contributes a, a certain amount as part of the budget, uh, contributes a certain amount every year 
uh, to PERS and TERS uh, to that investment pot, uh, to build that investment pot up, uh, to, to give it enough uh, size to spin off the earnings needed to pay out, uh, uh, pay out the PERS and TERS obligations. And then toward the end of the, of the obligations, of the life cycle obligations of uh, the PERS and TERS has, the defined benefit obligations, they'll start ramping down uh, that uh, that fund that's been built up over time, but it's a it's an annual state uh, it's an annual state an annual piece of the budget. It's included in the statewide uh, portion statewide uh, operating but the the portion of the operating budget that is statewide uh, matters. And it's not uh, it's not an insignificant amount. Uh, it's two hundred to three hundred million dollars uh, a year, uh, depending upon depending upon the year and depending upon what the actuaries say. Uh, the the contribution uh, uh, is, is due, and the, and the contribution is calculated based upon a complex formula that that accounts for the earnings that are expected to be produced from uh, from this investment amount, uh, as well as the expenses that are that are expected to be uh, covered over the lifetime of the of the tier one and, and other defined benefit um, obligations. What the Dunleavy administration proposed. Uh, and it came to a head yesterday in a meeting yesterday was to change uh, that actuarial calculation in a way that uh, uh, would would assume a higher return uh, from the from the investment amount going forward, and as a result of a higher return from the investments in that investment pot, uh, the, the the need for a lower contribution. Uh, from the from the state every year, the need, a need for a lower amount from the from the state budget every year, um, and the and 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 that lower amount would then translate essentially into a spending cut, because you wouldn't need to set aside as much of the state budget uh, for uh, for uh, uh, PERS and TERS. It was a way uh, that the Dunleavy administration, frankly, was trying to follow through on its proposal to reduce spending uh, in the near term. Uh, as as part of a piece of of, of of his fiscal plan, the problem with the proposal, uh, and I dug into it after I heard uh, uh, AML heard from AML on the issue. The problem with the proposal was it essentially uh, went against uh, uh, the recommendations of the actuary uh, over the years, and and in the in the view of the actuary, had the potential to underfund the obligation underfund the, the state's payments toward PERS and TERS and create a hole uh, in, in, in future years in PERS and TERS um, uh, that, that, would, you know, that would have to be closed by increased state funding in future years. It was right. essentially a, a pay less now to, and, and setting up a pay much more later Right uh, to make up for the hole created now. Right, uh, which so, which we which again this whole PERS and TERS mess came from an underfunding with a bad actuarial that we had over the years. I mean, we were upside down for so many years, and we're still not quite sure that we're on the top side of it. It doesn't seem like now is the is the good is the perfect time to go in there and start cutting into that. Yeah, exactly. I would I would credit the Dunleavy administration for for staying on top of. Of of that issue because if they can find a way to to reduce the the funding obligation to PERS and TERS, it does translate into a uh, into a reduction in uh, in the budget. Back in 2013, I think it was why it was why Parnell was still governor. It's either 2013 or 2014. Uh, at the direction of uh, at, at the at the substantial uh, uh, movement of of then uh, Senator Anna Fairclaw. Uh, now Anna McKinnon, but but then Senator Anna Fairclaw, who was who was co-chair of Senate Finance uh, during that period, uh, the state made a transfer of three billion dollars from the CBR. There's when you look at the decline in the CBR uh, over the past decade, there's a huge three billion dollar drop in it at one point. That is a transfer from the CBR over to the PERS and TERS investment account, um, and that was made at that time. Uh, uh, because the money wasn't earning a whole lot in uh, in the CBR, the way the CBR was invested, it wasn't earning a whole lot. Transferring that money over to PERS and TERS and having PERS and TERS investment produced a substantial additional amount of, of income, revenue going forward, that reduced the amount of payments that the state uh, had to make, uh, had, had to, ha has had to make to PERS and TERS. I recall 
this was early in the days that I was that I was focusing on the budget. But I recall uh, in 2012, 2011, 2012, 2013, we were the state was projecting more than a billion dollars a year would have to come out of the state budget. Uh, to to cover the whole uh, in person tourists to address the the problem that that you just referred to, so that was a that was a good step. Turns out to have been a good step uh, to put that three billion dollars over there, um, and 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 really helped uh, help shore up uh, helped uh, shore up that hole. So I I applaud the administration for staying on top of it and and seeing if there are any other things the administration can do along the way to reduce that obligation going forward, but changing uh changing the amortization going against the way we have been doing the actuaries have been doing the projection of the person tours amount uh, and changing it dramatically in a way that i that that i think I've, I've come to believe increases the risk that we just create another hole out there in the future someplace uh, i think it's the wrong way so good good for the administration to look at the issue bad for the administration to propose something that I think is is very short-sighted. And just to clarify for, for some folks who are asking questions in the chat room, you weren't opposed to the $3 billion transfer in the past, uh, but this you're saying, again, again, going against actuarial advice and, again, pr producing in the out years a potential to where we have to increase our spend into the PERS and TERS pay down. That's what your main hangup is, not the, not the past tr uh, transfer, which again did take off a lot of the pressure and really fixed a lot of our upside down uh, position on this. But it's this current one that you're talking about specifically. Right. I, I, I questioned the $3 billion uh, to some degree at the, at, when Anna first proposed it because I was concerned about what we were doing to the CBR, frankly, um, and, and whether we were setting up a problem with the CBR. Turns out we were. Uh, but I, but, but I, I came to understand what she was doing, what she was proposing, because of the trade out in the return that we were getting from the CBR versus the return we would get from having it uh, in the PERS, PERS and TERS account. This proposal from the administration isn't anything like that. They're not trying to transfer money out of, out of a low earning account into a higher earning account as, as what Anna proposed. They just want to reduce the amount that we're paying by, by deeming the the in the 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 earnings that can be produced from the invest from the existing investment account deeming them to that they'll, that they'll be higher uh going forward forward than what the actuaries have uh have uh, have proposed the actuaries are very conservative they're they're very i mean they 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 take great care to have conservative projections um uh, but i think that's a and and the and the administration i think was is 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 chafing at those conservative assumptions because the administration wants to lower what's in the budget every year. Um, but I think I think PERS and TERS is a place to be very conservative. I recall at one point uh, that uh, uh, oh god, who was the who was the former chairman of House Finance from the Valley back back in the day, um, Bill Stoltz. I recall that Stoltz at one point proposed going to a pay-as-you-go plan. For PERS and TERS, which was, which was sort of drain the the investment account by paying out of the investment account in any given year, whatever the PERS and TERS were, not putting any additional funding uh, into it from the from the uh, from the budget, uh, and and by 2031 we were just that proposal put us in a horrible mess. Uh, it lowered the current budget significantly because we no longer paid current. We no longer made any contributions out of the current budget to PERS and TERS, uh, but by tw by the early 2030s, we were in a horrible mess because we still had PERS and TERS obligations, but we had no money left to cover it. Right. We were going to have to pay as we went, and that is a billion dollar a year, a uh, billion plus dollar a year obligation. So, I, I again, the administration is doing a good thing by seeing if it can find any ways to tweak uh, to to lower lower current current budget. But playing around with the with the solidly solidly conservative assumptions that PERS and TERS is currently built on, I think is a very, very dangerous way to do it. Barbara said the current 
one being the current suggestion by the Dunleavy administration, is just as sound as Anna's. They're projecting a surplus because the actuaries are using overly conservative assumptions. Now, far be it from me to uh, bring up the past or anything, but, you know, we've heard this in the past, that the conservative assumptions of the actuarials are actually hurting us. And then we found out, of course, that the actuarials were wrong and that we should have been more conservative even than what the actuarials had said. And that's when we discovered we had a multi-billion dollar deficit to our PERS and TERS program, which, by the way, the PERS and TERS thing, whole thing scares the hell out of me because, you know, push comes to shove, the first thing they'll do is they'll just come in and tap the permanent fund itself to, to balance balance that out and and there will there will be when it's all said and done so what do you say to that when they're saying the person the uh, the actuarials are being too conservative and uh that this is this is a good thing we've been down this road before uh we were down this road after pers and ters blew up in the 2000s uh we've been down this road when uh when we pushed the three billion dollars over i've watched uh I've watched the the minutes, read the minutes of the of the arm board, the Alaska Retirement Management Board. Uh, ever since that time, uh, I know some of the arm board uh, members uh, personally. I have great faith in their in their uh, financial acumen, um, uh, and they uh, have uh, to a person that I've talked to since this since this issue came up said, "Look, you know, we we trust our actuary. We go through in detail with our actuary what they're doing." Uh, we we have our own views of where uh, of where investments are going, um, and and we think the actuary is in line with those. Uh, it's important to be conservative because of the consequence uh, uh, if we blow up pers and ters because of the consequence of the budget future budgets if we blow up for pers and ters again we need to be conservative about this. So, you know, I did I, I I chuckle a little bit when people say that the actuary is too conservative or the board's too conservative. I think they're. I think they are appropriately managing the exposure that Alaska has uh, on PERS and TERS, the future exposure that Alaska has on PERS and TERS, and I rely on them in the same way, frankly, that I rely on the on the uh, 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 the PFD permanent fund uh, 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 board, uh, who I have uh, uh, a lot of respect for, and the permanent fund administrator, who, uh, president, who I have a lot of uh, respect for. I think they're making very good decisions about uh, the exposures, uh, the investment position that Alaska has and the exposures that Alaska has going forward. Um, and, um, and, and don't believe that uh, we ought to be, uh, we ought to be second guessing, second guessing those. <laughs> she says they are projecting surpluses. Yeah. But all it takes is one or two good year or bad years to wipe those surpluses out. So again, <clears throat> I'm just remembering the shock that I felt when they first said that, yes, we're upside down and underwater f somewhere between seven and $11 billion on the PERS and TERS discussion. And I just, I mean, it just shocked me right down to my socks. So, I mean, at that point, that was in the early 2000s, as you point out. Yes, we may be projecting surpluses, but all it takes is one or two bad years or a market correction to wipe all that out. And then we're back upside down again. And nobody needs that at this point. We're, we're a lot of years out. We are a lot of years out before PERS and TERS is completely, those obligations are completely satisfied. And we still have a lot of money a lot of exposure at stake uh, on uh, on those obligations and 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 you know if 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 we do as we get closer to the end if we do end up with surpluses there are ways to deal with those surpluses at the end but but as we saw in the in the in the mid 2000s you don't want to pull back this early in the process from from your assumptions uh, uh, and start blowing holes in your current budget uh, so yeah yeah uh, i mean some some years you're going to see surpluses some years you're going to see uh, deficits. Uh, that's what the actuary does. They try to try to see through all that uh, long-term sustainable budget plan, as 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 we used to talk about. They try to see through all that uh, and determine a safe course, conservative course, and and that's what they're doing. And again, uh, I don't want to be. Uh, I don't think we ought to be second uh, guessing uh, the judgment of the members of the arm board uh, who are confirming uh, the direction that the that the that they're that they're going in. I will say. The, the the hearing yesterday ended with the administration withdrawing its proposal uh, to change that after a substantial pushback right. from the board. So I think that tells you all you need to know. Your final thoughts to people. I mean, what what can we as people, as just you know, plain old folk, do here as we watch this? I mean, is there something we can encourage in the special session? Should we just resign ourselves to the fact that this is a battle that we're going to have to fight next year? What what is your final thoughts here? To me, I would support. 
uh, I would I would express support to my legislators of what the working group did um, and push for uh, both sides, both the House and the Senate, to have to put forward bills that incorporate what the working group pro- proposed, to consider amendments uh, to those bills, but to focus their attention on the on the working group's uh, outcome. I I don't think I don't think these 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 side ideas of 2575 are going to go any place. I mean, if they were going to go any place, they would have gone someplace to this point. The working group came together, had a cohesive idea. A, a, a comprehensive plan on how to go forward, and I think we ought to be focused on that as opposed to reverting back to, to back to our uh, back to our separate uh, partisan corner. So, if I were to if I were to encourage things I've done and I would encourage others to do, is to is to encourage legislators uh, to focus uh, focus on the working group, particularly members of the working group like Calvin Schraggy. I mean, I I'm going to be very interested in what he does. In, in, in from his seat in House Ways and Means, uh, when they start consider when House Ways and Means starts considering 2575 instead of 5050, he was on the working group. He signed on to 5050. Um, I, I it, it's it's going to be just humorous as heck uh, if he just abandons that and said, yeah, yeah, I signed on to that, but I'm going to go this other direction. I mean, people ought to support what they did in the working group, and and I think constituents ought to push legislators to uh, to push forward on that proposal. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.